And so what happens is, is that they would take an individual and they would take a spike and they would place it through each hand here and they would take the person and they would nail them to the cross beam. They would bend the legs slightly so that there was a way for them to move like this and putting one foot over the other, they would drive a stake or that spike through their feet. Now they'd be able to move like this for a while. Now remember, the Lord Jesus Christ had just spent the night before being beaten. He was scourged. The Bible says that as he was dying on the cross, that he was marred beyond any man. So you wouldn't really even be able to recognize him, him hanging up there. And as he's hanging on this cross now, remember that, that he's sliding up and down this not nice polished like crosses that we wear, right? This was like a wooden beam that he's sliding up and down on his back. And for him to, to, to move it all, what would happen is he would have to push down on the spike that's in his feet and pull up with his ones that are his wrists. Now what happens after someone's on the cross for a while, the muscles in here begin to paralyze so that you can inhale, but you can't exhale. So you're like drooping down because you're so tired and it's just so painful that you're like, you're drooping down on the cross and your, your bones are beginning to pull out of joint, the Bible says. And so here, this is what's happening. This is just the physical pain that he's going through. And he goes down and then, and he can't breathe. So what happens? Well, he pushes down on the top of the wound that's in his feet. And using that as like a step to push up on and pulling up. <sighs> and then after a while, as the muscles begin to tense up again and the pain is just too excruciating, he slides back down the cross again. This, happens, this happened to thousands of people. This wasn't just the Lord Jesus Christ. This was thousands of people that were killed under the Romans. But this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a sinner. <laughs> falsely accused criminal hanging there in my place in my place as he hangs there now for him to say anything he's got to push down on the spike he's got to pull up on his hands and now he's got to speak it's with intent this wasn't just sort of mumblings of a of a madman these were with intent he was speaking during that first three-hour period as the Lord Jesus Christ hung there, there were three things that the Lord Jesus said. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, the first thing He does is pray. He prays for those who are persecuting Him. He prays for those who are the ones who are, on the, the, the ones who are crucifying Him. But really, that prayer extends because when He hung there, it wasn't the Jews that crucified Him, although they were involved. It wasn't the Romans that crucified Him, although they were involved. It wasn't the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, although that they were involved. He hung there because of my sin. Because there was no other way that I could be forgiven other than Him hanging there in my place and dying on that cross. There was no other sacrifice that would be good enough. There was no one else who could do the work on my behalf. He had to die. It was necessary for the Christ to die so that forgiveness and repentance could be preached to all nations, the Bible says. So as Jesus is hanging there, He prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His mom is watching him die. She's standing at the foot of the cross. I bet you her heart was just, well, the prophet said, right? It will pierce your heart. A sword will. He was dying for her as well. Be very clear on that. But she was watching him die. One of his disciples there, we believe it was John, and he looks at, he looks at, these two, and there were other ladies that were there, there were other people, but he speaks to his mom, he speaks to um, this disciple that he loves, and he says to, to her, woman, behold your son. They weren't family, but he made him family. He gave him the trust and care of one another, and he said, this is your mother. Take care of my mom, right? Who's he cared about now? Jesus, he's hanging on the cross. Who's he interested in? Oh boy, this hurts. No, it's like praying for those that are doing the work. He's concerned about his mom who's hanging, he's hanging there and he's dying. He's concerned about his mom and, and, and her care. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. 
This is all during the first three hours that Jesus hangs on the cross. There's another one. I have to say this is one of my favorites. Because as Jesus is dying there, there's two other guys, two other criminals that are being crucified on either side of him. And throughout the day, throughout this period of time, this first three hours, there's that, there's that sign above Jesus' head that this is the king of the Jews, and he is the king of the Jews, and it's hanging there, and this is his crime. He couldn't help that. That was his identity. And there he is. And, and these men on either side, they're beginning to mock him. Oh, you think you're the son of God? You really think you're the Christ? Get off the cross. Take us with you. Go on. Prove it, man. Boy, that sounds like what happened in the desert, doesn't it? If you're really the Son of God, like change this and, and do this and, and do this. Prove you are. If you're really the Son of God, come off the cross. And as they're making fun of him, something's, something's happening to one of them. I believe it was the one on his right hand. And as, and as Jesus is there and as he's, as, he's, as, he's, um, as he's going through this and he's praying for those that are persecuting him and he's taking care of his mom and this disciple and making them family, this, this, this prisoner, this, this absolutely wretched man that, that was being executed with the death penalty under Rome hanging next to him and he, he, he's watching this and something's going on in his mind, something's going on in his heart, something's going on in his understanding. It's almost as if someone's pulling back the curtain for him it's almost as if somebody like pulls it back and he looks at Jesus and he no longer sees this human being that's dying he no longer sees just this just this man who claimed to be this or claimed to be that but now he looks at him and he sees someone entirely different he sees the Christ he sees the Son of God hanging there next to him you know something what what, what strikes me about it is that the Lord Jesus Christ, as he's hanging on that cross, where else was he going to meet with that thief? When else would that thief have the opportunity to like talk to Jesus face to face? And as he hangs there, right? This, this thief turns and, and, and after he's, he had already just said bad things to him and this and that, but something's changing now and he tells Jesus, in fact, he rebukes the other guy, says, listen, don't you fear God, we're getting what we deserve. He's done nothing wrong. And he looks at Jesus and remember, he's got to do the same stuff. This is with intent and he's crying out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Forget you, man. What are you talking about? Remember me. You were just making fun of me, man. You don't deserve this. Is that what he said? No. He said, I tell you the truth, assuredly. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Those three phrases, Luke on 23 and verse 34, John 19, verses 26 and 27, and this last one, Luke 23 and verse 34. Three things. The first one is a prayer of forgiveness. Understanding that it was why Jesus died there on the cross, that as he died there, he was paying for our forgiveness. He was the one that was taking our sin on himself so that we could be the ones forgiven. When I was a kid, my mom, she, you know, she'd spend hours cleaning the house. And, uh, and I loved playing outside. I, liked, I loved climbing trees. And I'd get all full of like sap and dirt and mud and everything else. And, like, and I, would, I would come into the house. And there were times mom said, listen, you know, I've cleaned the house. Leave your shoes at the door. I don't want the dirt in the house. So sometimes it was even worse than that. Like, you got to take up my trousers and everything else like a little little boy outside trying to just get cleaned up then like go right into the bathtub kind of thing but my mom would clean the house and she didn't want dirt in the house God's house it's absolutely clean it's called holy it's like light and there's no darkness at all it's absolutely pure and you know God doesn't want any dirt in his house none problem is you're not taking your shoes with you so you can't leave your shoes at the door God doesn't look at the outward appearance where does he look the heart you need your heart clean 